Welcome back. You're now watching the lifestyle segment of the weekend show brought to you by Holy Crunch Popcorn. So just last week, Senator Ademola Adeleke, the candidate of the PDP, um, won the Ocean State elections with 403,371 votes, while um, his opponent, the incumbent governor of Ocean State, had 375,227 votes. Now, this has um, raised a lot of comments in the public with um, people commending the Independent National Electoral um, Commission for um, actually announcing the results in due time and the transparency which Nigerians saw during the election. Even the president has congratulated um, the candidate on winning this election. As that has happened, we also ask the question, did the Electoral Act contribute in making this election successful because of what we've seen in Ocean State and Akita State? And having this conversation with us, we have... Onoja Ilemona, who is a legal practitioner and public affairs analyst. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you very much, Andy. Onoja, good morning. Good morning. So, uh, you are a member of the PDP. So, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations <laughs> um, <laughs> on your party winning the Ocean State election um, and it's interesting because this came at a time when the m it was all over social media and the media saying there were rifts within the party which could jeopardize the party's um, chances. What's your overview of the Ocean State elections? I think that the first place to start with that is to commend the foresight the party had. Foresight the party had um, to set up a National Reconciliation Commi and Strategy Committee in November 2020. It's, I think it's the appropriate place to start. That um, uh, committee was um, headed by Dr. Bukola Saraki and had on it Senator Leah Limoke, Alaji Ibrahim, Alaji Ibrahim Shema, um, Alaji Ibrahim Dankwambo, um, Senator pa Anim Pius Anim and Honorable Mulika Tabiola. Now, that committee laid the framework for the dispute resolution that manifested in the Ocean elections. Yes, there were still skirmishes, there were still misunderstandings that were resolved, you know, in the immediate build up to the elections. But that committee laid the framework, identified the issues, and ensured that. Unlike in 2018, where there was a rift and somebody left the party and took with him a major part of the party structure, which left the party defective and disunited going into the election. This time, that didn't happen. And even though um, people like Dr. Aki Ogumbi left, they, they, the party was able to remain substantially united. Is that the committee gives us the hope and, and, and the faith in the PDP, for instance, that we will see Ogun flip in 2023 and that in 2024 we'll see Ondo flip. These are examples. Now, um, yes, there are still s um, misunderstandings in at, at mostly at the national level of the party in the build-up to and in the aftermath of the presidential primaries that we saw in May that it was. But you know, there's a more cohesive party structure at the ward, local government, and state levels, and even at the national level, we just believe that this disagreement or these um, misunderstandings that have come out in the immediate aftermath of the presidential primaries will soon be resolved. And then we'll see the party function more cohesively as a political machinery. But the foundations that were, the, the building that we saw that was the victory in the Austrian election, which we hope to build on going into the general elections last year. Um, next year, sorry, were laid over the course of last maybe two years. Hmm. So I understand you belong to the same party as the governor who won as a delegate. Yes. So governor can you can you <laughs> can you speak to us on his win? Do you think he is the competent choice? Certain things I find remarkable about him. Certain things. One, he his compassion. And I'll come, I'll say all that and then I'll answer your question mm. directly. One, his compassion. Very compassionate, not afraid to wear his heart on his sleeve, very empathetic, and, and very dedicated to his goals. One thing that struck me about him in this electoral cycle was him coming out and saying, well, he didn't so much say it as showed it, 
when you know he was mocked in 2018 about the quality of his WIAC results, if anybody remembers yes. that, right? And he goes back, makes sure he clears that, goes to school in the U.S. and graduates with a bachelor's degree in security studies. Now that, to me, is a person who shows a desire for excellence at that level. We can only, um, we can only assess him so far by right? the successes he's, he's had in his private life. He hasn't held executive office. He was a competent legislator. He was a very good legislator. And not only that, he was... Um, not only that, he's been very successful in his business practice, in private practice. It leads me to the almost inescapable conclusion that he's a competent that he will be a competent governor. Definitely, definitely going to be more competent or more effective than the current governor or than what APC has offered or shown for the last 12 years. What we will be, what I am unable, and this is me being brutally honest, is how much more competent, it's going to be more competent by miles. I'll just not be able to, um, I'm just not being able to say the scale by which you'll be more competent, but definitely the more competent choice. So talk, talk, talking about the Ocean um, election, while um, the People's Democratic Party would want to take credit, rightfully so, for the elections, um, there are several other factors which we um, observe, such as the people, the people, the numbers of people who, who had come out to vote, um, people like Davido, um, who was fiscally present. Do you feel that it's because of the support for the party or the fact that people were just tired because of the poverty and unemployment and all the issues in the country? So do you think it's just a case of whoever the alternative option is? or um, So the role of the people, basically. Do you think it's the party or the people? Um, there were several alternatives. Let's, let's not get it wrong. There were 18 political parties in that election. 423 plus thousand people chose PDP. So it's not just about people having an alternative. They, ha they were determined to pick one alternative. The comb combined factor of all the other political parties was what, maybe 17,000 votes? That was not an error. People chose PDP. Now, if you look at election new voter registration numbers, you see something very quickly. Osho has the second highest number of newly registered voters in the Southwest. It's not by mistake. It was carefully, over time, curated. The party and the candidates put out a structure that encouraged new voters to go and register but not only kept them at the registration level, encouraged them to cast their votes for the party. Which is the reason why if you go and check the election results, there were more than 100,000 new voters, or the, the, the difference in results this year and in 2018 is about 100 and something thousand. Now, quite a number of those were people who had voted for the SDP candidate. In 2018, that SDP candidate is now the National Secretary for APC. One will consider, one would have thought that if it was about the person, those candidates would have followed him to APC. Those voters, sorry, would have followed him and voted for the APC. But that didn't happen. They reverted back to traditional, their traditional voting base, which is the PDP. And then you had new voters who... The party carefully, and I must stress this, carefully encouraged, gave a structure, made it easier for them to register to vote, but also maintained contact to encourage them, to engage with them, to campaign to them, and get them to vote for the PDP candidate. So as much as I say that it was about the, the charisma and the belief in the competence of and faith in the candidate it was also the realization that see this party our lives were better under under the leadership of this political party 
we had better outcomes under the leadership of this political party. And this political party has the more realistic, in addition to being better, in addition to giving us better outcomes, in addition to us having better lives and um, quality of lives and well-being, this party also presents the most realistic opportunity to remove the government in power that we consider that has failed us and to replace it with better. So it was a combination of things. But mm. the party was a fundamental primary factor. Okay. Emmanuel Andrejko, thanks for joining us. Good Thank morning. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Nigeria. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Okay, so uh, speaking off of what I just said, uh, voters, do you think vote buying played a part in the Ocean State election compared to what we saw at Atakiti? <laughs> of course, vote buying played a major role. Of course, vote buying has increased from what we saw in Akiti State. In fact, vote buying, since this Electoral Act has been signed into law, since the Beavers has, the, there is a law backing Beavers and Beavers has been in place, vote buying has increased. So we observed the election and literally across every polling unit across Ocean State, there was vote buying going on. Across the whole parties, basically, especially the two major parties from what we saw in Ocean State election. But what does that tell you? And I always say this, I think I've said this on this show before, that vote buying in a funny way is progress. Progress in the sense that, yeah, I see your face there. <laughs> <laughs> I see your face there. When I say vote buying is progress, I say it's progress in the sense that all of a sudden, political parties have realized that it's about the people. Political parties have realized that for once, we are having real elections where the people matter, where the people are the center of the conversation, where the votes, they now know that it's about the people that will put them in power. Before, that was not the case. Before, it's about, it was about political parties finding ways around manipulating some, some, some of the staff of INEC who are corrupt to get them to manipulate the numbers. It was about bribing the poll clerks and the, and the party agents at the, at the polling units to do manual accreditation, use incidence form, and do multiple term printing, and, and, and you bring out very funny numbers. But these politicians have realized that it is a conversation that they have to do with the people. Progress in the sense that vote buying is a transaction, funny transaction. But then again, election and running for office is still a transaction of some sort. You want to say you want to be the chairman of Weekend Show Program and we'll have staff. You have to tell us what you want to give to us. You have to tell us that, yeah, we'll have good work shifts. You want to tell us that we're going to have health benefits. You're telling us what you're bringing to the table. But before these people just go to the people and they just buy votes, that conversation is changing because the power is on the people. But the people have not yet realized how much power that has been given to them through this electoral 2022. If they realize that, and I hope they do, and it's the job of the media, Political parties, civil society, everybody, government institutions, INEC, to engage citizens more for them to understand that it's not about collecting that 5,000, 10,000. Step up your game and step up this transaction to demand primary health care centers that are not working. <coughs> Universities are on strike. Public primary schools are dead in Nigeria. There are no, the roads are dead traps. These are conversations you have to step up to, to demand. Now that you've understood that as a citizen, these mm. people are coming to you to buy your votes. Why are they buying your votes? It's because you are important. It's because without you, they can't get into that office. And listen to what my friend King has been talking about. If you notice, he's been talking about the voter register. He's talking about the voters. He's talking about how they intentionally try to get the voters to come out. Because with the beavers, it's no longer business as usual. You need the people to come out and vote. So you need to engage them. So vote buying played a role in the election. Beyond the popularity of the candidate of AP, uh, PDP and the candidate of the, of the APC, even in, in a Kitty State where, election, where, we, where we observe the election, mm. vote buying played a major role a week or two before the election. You know, if you were in the state and you had a conversation in the rural communities, you will, you, the result that came out is not what you think that will come out. But on the day of election, we saw the party that won in that election spending as high as 10,000 naira to buy votes. Not like the others didn't buy, the others bought. They were spending the range of 3,000, 4,000, 2,000 naira. So I would say that the party that literally won the election outspent and outbought the voters in the state election. So, yes. Vote buying played a major role, and that is the major concern of electoral stakeholders at this time. That is the devil who have to fight ahead of 2023 election to change the narrative and make the people's vote to genuinely count without being induced. Okay, I know. I saw your facial reaction when you were speaking. <laughs> yes, can you respond? Let me, let, me, let me say this. It did happen. Mm. And again, brutal honesty. It did happen. Right? 
But a number of things for me. Within the PDP, for instance, quite a number of people had foregone the equity elections. The energy of the party towards the elections were different. The outcomes, the turnout of the party structure was different. Why? It was different because the party had internal problems that had been unable to overcome. And so a lot of people felt, we're going to lose these elections anyway, votes bought or not. A lot of people already thought we we're going to lose these elections. The energy of the party in Oshun was completely different. Completely. More cohesive unit, like I said. And it got to the place where, and this is to address your point directly, yes, votes were being sold and bought. But people were taking the money and saying, no, I'm not going to vote for you. I'm going to take your money, but I'm not going to vote for you. People were looking at it and saying, I don't want your money. I'm going to vote the way my conscience wants me to go. So while vote buying existed in the context of the elections, the people who were paying out significantly more lost the elections. The person, the party that paid out 10,000 naira per vote lost the elections. So it is actually possible within the context of the votes being bought for the elections to reflect a genuine desire for a particular kind of leadership. It's actually very possible. And that's what happened in Oshun. It happened, the outcome of the election was in spite of that, of that, the outcome of the election was in spite of, and I agree with you completely, I wish we'd get to a place where this whole transactionary thing of give me 10,000 naira and take my vote will stop. Mm. But in the context of the elections, while it happened, yeah, I don't think it was the determinant okay, so, for how so, the election so, so, results um, came I need to, I need to say something to Nigerians. Dear Nigerians, exactly. just to be clear, no one here is supporting no. vote buying. Uh, yes, thank, um, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. And so just, just <laughs> put that clear. And I'm, I'm coming back to you before... No, before, you we, before we lose this thought, just okay. for Nigerians that are watching, you know, so don't think they are... Don't sit there watching us and think that on election day you, you will come out like he's saying and collect the money and you wouldn't mm -hmm. vote. That doesn't happen. In the elections, at the polling unit, that can happen before the election, a day or two before the election. But on the election day, you can't say, in fact, they don't even pay you before you vote. The party agents, these things are so coordinated. You have to vote at the point where you are voting. Someone is near the polling booth. That's why we're talking about secrecy of the ballot. What's compromised? Because at the end of the day, you see people standing very close to the ballot, to the to the to the to the to the uh, to the, to the, to the, the okay. ballot box where people drop their votes. So before you even cast your vote, someone is standing watching you, and you must because you you you've already agreed to trade your vote. You have to clearly make your make your ballot seen to that party agency. That, that party agent could be one guy. It could be one old woman. It could be one. Not see more than kind of baby at the back sitting down looking tired. It could be anybody. But they know they are watching you. It's at the point they confirm who you voted for that you now move out and meet another middleman who will now probably give you a tally. You now go outside the place and now go and collect money for the voting. So don't think that they say, I ah, collect their money and vote. No, that can happen before the election day. But on the election day, that doesn't happen. All the parties we saw, they give money after the person has voted. And that is evil. That is that is that is terrible. That is very backward. I like that, that is killing our nation. Evil and just to uh, put it out there. Um, I like that you say that's evil and backward. And just uh. also Nigerians um, ask uh, about that. But We've seen a major change since um, the signing of the Electoral Act. I want to also give credit um, to people like um, Chief Osasu Ibnidio, um, our producer, who we had a segment just for the Electoral Act amendments with Ariel Aristotle oh, for quite a long time. CSOs, NGOs pushed for it. However, tell us about Ima, the impact of the amended Electoral Act um, on the last two elections we've seen. So first of all, um, before now, you know, if you look at the numbers of um, voter turnout in most elections before now, uh, you so let's start from let's start from Anambra coming to FCT Council Post, coming to Ekiti, and coming to Ashun. So all of a sudden, people are beginning to have trust in the system. There was that trust deficit before now. You know, so there's this conversation. They say people that live in city centers, urban centers. People like me, myself and yourselves here, that would do not vote. It's not like people in citizens don't vote. And that's where the population is. 
But they don't vote because they don't trust the system that you come out, you spend the whole day, and at the end of the day, someone just does multiple time printing, and you are leaving the polling unit, you are seeing the numbers, then when you hear the results, it's something totally different. For that reason, people didn't have trust in the system. But with the signing of the Electoral Act, we've seen how we affected from the... So people are, people are watching, people are seeing. When we went to a state election, you know, there was this, given how the beavers, especially the beavers, which is supposed to do the, the, the accreditation. Because the first point of manipulating the, electra, the election and election day is the point of accreditation. Before, in the, before now, what we had was the card reader, where when you come to polling unit, they just do manual accreditation. And once election gets to the point of manual accreditation and bringing out incidents, from, just know that that election has already been rigged once they go to that manual accreditation. So that has changed. When we went to Equity State, we wanted to know how will the beavers work? How will INOC make their deployment? Particularly, will the votes at the polling unit be the same at the collation center? But at the end of the election, it was a very successful election. But then there was a conversation that, hey, Equity State is small. They have only 16 local government areas. They have less than 1 million registered voters. And now we cannot, they, in a case, there is no place that is more than two hours from any point of it. So it's a small, there's no hard to reach areas that we cannot judge that this electoral act is this effective as regards election day processes. Now let's wait for Ashun State. Now Ashun happened. Ashun has 30 local government areas. Ashun has doubled the number of registered voters in a case, 1 million, registered voters. And we saw how successful it is. And we've seen voter turnout. So it has effect. Now, in this election for once in Nigeria we saw a governorship election where there was 42.09 voter turnout on election day that has never happened in the history of elections from 99 down to 2000 and 2007 the voter turnout keeps dropping dropping especially after every election cycle there is always a little of reforms and all of those things seems to kind of tackle you know uh, 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 vote manipulation and for that reason the numbers keep dropping even when those numbers are dropping like in, in, in 2019 general election you see the total number of votes that came for a presidential election was about 28 million votes that came in in the actual sense if you put into consideration how much the, the, the process was manipulated using manual, manual accreditation and, and manual, manual, uh, manual voting on the voter register those numbers is 28 million was probably half of that number but in a soon election, where every person that came out was biometrically accredited, we saw 42.09% voter turnout. That is a lot of improvement. And it shows that Nigerians all of a sudden are beginning to have trust in the system. It shows that Nigerians are beginning to engage. And I believe as we, as a lead up to 2023 general elections, even these conversations that people in city centers will not vote, that will change drastically in this election because they've now come to trust the system. And frankly, like you said, all kudos to INEC, first of all, even to the president, President Muhammad Buhari. Frankly, in my opinion, in the midst of all the issues and all the challenges that we faced since this administration came into power in 2015, for me, in the midst of all the progressive you know, that this government has done. This is one real thing that I would say that this administration has done to bring forth this electoral reform. So kudos to him, kudos to INEC, kudos to civil society, and kudos to all the electoral stakeholders who have made this happen. The game has changed. It is no longer business as usual. Trust me, in National Assembly, because of the electoral that they signed, and without putting in consideration section, section 84, subsection 8, that affected them and gave all the powers to the governors to select who comes to National Assembly in the next 10th, uh, is it ninth or 10th Assembly? Yeah. Close to the say 45% of them already lost out from their political parties. I tell you, the remaining 55% that you see, most of them will still lose out. In, you know why? Some of these guys that you tag that they are popular are not that popular. We are going, people that are popular are going to start winning elections. And I say this, I, t I said this in a particular platform yesterday. I say, this is a country where you sit, talking about how this electoral act is going to change the game. This is a country where you see someone sits somewhere and is telling you, I made you governor. I made you governor. I am the king come of this region. I am the this of this region. You pick, you say, I made this person president. That is disrespect to the people of Nigeria because you don't make people governors. The citizens decide who becomes their governor, who leads them. But because of so all this power and all this popularity, it's just people's capacity to rig and manipulate the process. Going forward in 2020 election, all of these guys that you see as the King Kongs of these political parties, it will no longer, you won't see it happen. Many of them will lose the elections because the people, for once, are going to start deciding who is going to rule them, who is going to be their Manager, leader. Do you also, uh, would you commend INEC also for the just concluded oh, by, primaries? By, by all means, by all means. I, I think that INEC, INEC, INEC stood firm. Hmm. And this is why I struggle to commend 
APC <laughs> or the president, president, they were dragged to signing the new Electoral Act. It wasn't something they wanted to do. And they showed that they didn't want to do it. We could have had this sort of Earlier. improvement in 2019. The president knew that if he gave us an improved electoral cycle, if he signed the Electoral Act, which was passed four times by the eighth Senate, he'd have lost the elections. And so he refused to do it. They were dragged there. It was the work of people like Ario and um, Adopt a Go Foundation and all that, and the media and public awareness that forced them there. And when they got there, they, re they realized, they're realizing now the scale of reform. They didn't know the scale of reform that they're doing, but they did. They're only just realizing it now. So I struggle to commend. I mean, but coming to, to this, remember that several times the politicians said to INEC, we cannot do electronic transmission of results. Bivas will not work because of no network and all that. And all the other sub stories that they tried to give us. And the INEC chairman stood firm and said, we're ready. And every time they brought him to the National Assembly, he repeated it, we're ready. So the commendation actually goes to INEC that put the infrastructure in place and then backed it with the will, with the will to say we are going to have better, more credible elections. I struggle to commend anybody Manager, else. My I last mean, um, question for you before we, before we also give him his final thoughts. Um, the PDP at the national level has its level of crisis. However, um, in line with what we are talking about, how it's the people that now decide, um, the absence of the River State Governor, Nilsson Wiki, was quite um, noticeable, <laughs> and also the oil counterpart and some other people. But the PDP still won the election. So does this mean that um, these people don't add the value anymore, or does this just affirm that it was the people? Um, several things, several things. But I'll quickly say there's no way anybody will look at a governor like we can say it doesn't matter, it doesn't add value. Shea McIndy, Samuel Otom. It's impossible to say that politicians of that sort of level, of that sort of um, experience, simply do, they don't add value. It's impossible to say so. Um, governor Wiki is a human being. He's never been afraid to hide. He doesn't wear, he doesn't, I mean, he wears his heart on his sleeve, right? And he always just tells you how he feels. By his conduct at the moment, he's letting everybody know that he's unhappy with the outcome of the primary, presidential primaries and, and you know, incidents that are followed thereafter. I reckon that um, in time, because he's always said that if I lose, I'm not going to leave the party. If I lose any of the political battles I'm fighting within the party, I'm not going to leave it. I feel that in time that there will be a resolution and he will have a more hands-on approach. But while that was going on, while they were um, uh, absent and I'm, uh, while they were not there, um, e even though Samuel Otom, the deputy governor, he was out of the country, deputy governor of Benue was in, was in Oshun, um, uh, Shea Makinde also played a very serial ro a serious role behind the scenes. He didn't have to be physically present. Are you saying this because you're a party member? I'm because not saying this. We're this saying this on the support this which is what happened. people gave, which happened. they gave. This is what happened. Mm. I'm not saying it because I'm a party member. Even the governor of Benue has come out to say, I, made, I wasn't in the country, but I made sure my deputy was there. Uh, so this is what happened. Now, ha having said that, the party also made sure that while these people were absent, we found other people to play very strategic roles. I'll give another example. Bukola Saraki I was... training agents. Yes, he was there in the training of the agents. You know, I, I'm telling, teaching them how to ensure that Beavers was complied with, how to ensure that um, results were immediately uploaded to the INEX server, how to make sure, make sure, stay there, look at it until the, the machines indicate to you that the results have been transmitted, you know, conduct and all that. You know, and we saw the governor of Edo, we saw the governor of Bielsa. These people all played a serious role. So everybody couldn't have been there. Mm. But the party had a unanimous, a very cohesive approach to the election. And I believe as much as we have these problems and as much as they are there pdp has always had the ability to put its house in order in time you know and ha it has we've had for years a dispute resolution structure that somehow or the other works and takes us over the finish line it's not perfect by by no means is it perfect but it exists and is there and i reckon that it will implement it will come into play 
and it will reunite the party and it will shape us just before the elections. I must, however, sound a note of warning to our party leaders. This is taking too long. This, this particular fallout from the presidential primaries has been unresolved for too long. And while we are realizing that, while we're taking our time to resolve them, people are making their decisions up, minds up. And they're making decisions about who to vote for. And we're taking too long to come back as that cohesive unit about which I speak to say, okay, this is the reason why you will vote for us. Yesterday, um, the candidate of the, um, the party held his first um, interview, his first public interview mm -hmm. since he did, since he won the primaries. And there was a feeling from the populace of finally, you know, there was like a sigh of relief from the public. We're taking a little bit too long. Dear leaders of our political party, can you please speed this up? We need to go away from conversations about the challenges within the party and focus on what is important. Yeah, and, okay. and focus on, 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 on our insecurity issues and focus on the on rising the poverty levels and focus on, you know, on what the, is important to Nigerian people so that we can give them, show them that we're a viable alternative okay, Mano, for you share leadership. Your yep, final yep. words before we end this. I'm excited. Mm. I'm very happy. Democracy... Um, the, the foundation of democracy is at the point of recruitment of your political leaders. And I'm happy that we're, we are getting it right. That, 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 that trust is now there. And so I want to urge every Nigerian watching to understand that the votes are now counting. There is no, if there has ever been a time that you should participate in... You know, voting in an election is the least, least effort every citizen can make towards participating in democracy. And that's the point where everybody participates. So if you are watching this, there's never a time in the last two decades of my adult life, I've never, I've never really seen it this bad in a nation. I've never seen insecurity this terrible in the nation. I've never seen yesterday or two days ago, the Minister of Finance is telling us that so, so our, our, uh, the cost of servicing our debt and is now higher than the income that we're making as a nation. So the country is going down every day. It's not enough to be on Twitter. It's not enough to be on social media. It's not enough to have conversations. Make sure that in 2023, that you do not just vote, but that you engage everybody, those your grandfather, your grandmother, your relatives back at home in the rural communities, because those are usually the target of vote buying, because of ignorance, because of poverty. Reach out to those places. For people watching from diaspora, you are sending money home to Nigeria every day to your relatives. As you are sending money to them, make them understand the evil of vote buying, so that in 2023, votes will not just count, but there will be little effect of voter inducement, so that we will have the kind of leadership that we truly desire at a time like now. I think that's thank a you. great place to leave it. And thank you, Elimona and Emmanuel, for coming on. Thank you. I want to say a happy belated birthday to <laughs> Didi. It was your birthday on Tuesday. I don't <laughs> see cake you. here. <laughs> but happy birthday. We wish thank you, you a great thank year. Thank you very much. Home. That's all we can take on the lifestyle segment. But we still have more on the weekend show. However, we do have um, opportunities for young people who are graphic designers, editors who may want um, to join the weekend show team. Follow us on social media at Weekend Show NG on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't go away. More after this break.